glycemic control and intensive insulin therapy in critical illness. That is the broad topic that we are going to discuss. Now, I have divided the uh, discussion into two parts. Uh, the first we will be discussing some theoretical aspects and some uh, clinical evidence on this topic and the second part would be the practical aspect of how you would initiate uh, or titrate insulin regimes. Okay. So, right now we all understand that uh, there has to be whenever you are talking about glycemic control, the important thing is target. Okay. Now, last time we had discussed that in a non-critical ill setup, we generally target the fasting sugar close to 90 to 130 and post meal sugars less than 180, right? That is our general target. But in critical illness and for reasons which I am going to discuss, the general target that we keep in a critical ill patient is a range of 140 to 180 milligram per deciliter in adults, okay? So, today we will be mainly discussing on adults. Uh, perhaps you can have a separate talk on pediatrics as well because that is an also in a very interesting area. Now, what are the issues that lead to uh, hyperglycemia in critical ill patients, right? So, there is, there are two aspects. So, one is that there are, there is an increase of counter regulatory hormones. Also, we use some of these counter regulatory hormones in our critical practice as well, right? And then there is increase, increase insulin resistance. Now, one rule of uh, medicine in general is that we need to understand that hyperglycemia is something which could often be reactionary to any infection or inflammatory condition, right? So, often see, you know, you have seen lot of patients where, uh, you know, you have a patient with known case of diabetes, generally doing well HbA1c 6.8, 6.9, but has a urinary tract infection or has a pulmonary infection, right? Has some kind of respiratory infection, has a diabetic foot. In such situation, the patient gets severe hyperglycemia, right? So, this we had, I think this last time also discussed and uh, in past also we had discussed this, that there is something called glucose toxicity or glucotoxicity. So, it is a vicious cycle. So, whenever a patient is in a state of infection or inflammation, the body in response to that increases the counter regulatory hormones, increases insulin resistance and that leads to increase of blood sugar. And that increase of blood sugar does two things. A, if there is an underlying infection, it perpetuates the infection and B, uh, what it secondarily does is it produces, it stuns the beta cell and it produces less amount of insulin. So, this creates a negative vicious cycle where the infection perpetuates the, in, uh, you know, the increase of blood glucose, the glucotoxicity and the increase of glucotoxicity perpetuates the infection, right? So, this cycle is something which often needs to be broken and often you would have seen that, you know, patients where you are able to successfully control the blood sugar, also the patient clinically also improves in the same regard. Right? So, when the blood sugar breaks down to, you know, you have a patient who is uh, admitted with HP, you know, with blood glucose of 300, 400 and once the blood glucose starts coming down, right, not only does, you know, uh, the overall clinical condition of the patient improve, but overall the, uh, you know, the glycemic control also improves, right. So, this is something which you need to be affect, you know, aware of about, right. Now, like I said, uh, we also need to understand that we ourselves use certain counter regulatory hormones in critical illness, which also contributes to the same process, right. And two of them are absolutely essential that we need to understand. The vasopressins that we use, right, the vasopressors that we use, noradrenaline, adrenaline, everything, they are, remember, counter regulatory to insulin and they will increase the blood sugar, right. The glucocorticoid steroids that we use will increase the blood sugar. These two things you have to be absolutely aware about. Also, you have to be aware about that if you are giving some sort of IV insulin infusion in such patients, whenever you reduce the dose of vasopressors or whenever you reduce the dose of glucocorticoids, the insulin requirement will also reduce. And if you do not take that into account, the patient can develop severe hypoglycemia, right? So, what you have to understand is that when you are managing a patient in critical illness or when you are managing, managing a patient in ICU, you need to understand that on one hand, right, your hyperglycemia could be reactionary to the drugs you are giving. But when you are tapering of those medications also, you need to understand that the patient can then go into a state of hypoglycemia. Now, one thing we need to understand that hyperglycemia in general, right? So, whenever you have a patient, uh, if you have extremes of blood sugar, so patients with blood sugar of 400, 500 or patients with very low blood sugar, right? Patient with uh, frank hypoglycemia, both these situations, the patient is going to have poor clinical outcome, right? So, not only is hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia a marker of the clinical state of the patient, it is also a marker of the overall, you know, practical clinical outcome of the patient. 
Okay. What about uh, you know? So this is true for all sorts of patients. So you have let's say trauma patients. There are studies which are done that uh, you know in patients coming with trauma, right? Uh, blood sugar more than 200 is associated with poor outcome. In both medical and surgical ICUs, and I'll show you some clinical studies. Uh, increase of blood sugar both in medical and clinical and surgical ICU, right? Increase of blood sugar is definitely directly associated with increased mortality, right? Again, it's a graded effect. So higher the blood glucose, more the mortality, right? And specifically, there are a lot of studies done in uh, you know cardiac ICUs where they looked at patients with stroke and myocardial infarction, where they again shown that uh, in this kind of situation also there is an increased mortality. Now, let's talk about surgical patients, and there are two clinical trials. Like I said, you know, a lot of these things come from uh, clinical trials, and there are two landmark clinical trials uh, in surgical patients which looked at the importance of glycemic control. Interesting part is actually both the trials were very different, uh, and the results and the outcome were also different, right? Now there is a very famous uh, intensivist uh, Greet Vandenberg uh, uh, from Netherlands. There was a period of time, you know, if you have seen uh, somewhere uh, in 2000s. Uh, almost every alternate NEGM publication came from Netherlands, right? There was a time where publications were, uh, you know, large in Netherlands, even today. And that time, there was this study which was published called the Leuven study, which was very, very critical in our understanding of hyperglycemia. What they did was they took patients in surgical ICU, and they, you know, this is also known as the Dutch trial, where they put the patient on intensive glycemic control with a blood sugar of 80 to 110, right? So this was the uh, Leuven study, where they intensively treated the patient with intensive glycemic control, and the other group where they had a more reasonable, you know, uh, not that tight glycemic control. Now, what they clearly defined was that the patient with an intensive group where there was an intensive glycemic control, clearly there was reduction in the surgical, uh, you know, complications, uh, improvement in the clinical outcome, early discharge, uh, less mortality, less morbidity, everything, right? So this was the Leuven trial, which for a period of time led to ICUs across the country scampering to try to bring blood sugar to a tight control of 80 to 110. However, this trial was heavily criticized, right, for a fact that there are also increased risk of hypoglycemia and there was also mortality contributory to hypoglycemia, right. So a consortium of, uh, you know, clinicians across or intensivists across the globe decided to conduct a study where they wanted to explore whether do you really need this tight control or can you do a reasonable control. And this is where the NICE sugar trial really came into picture, where what they did was they took two groups, one group where they kept the blood sugar between 140 to 180 and the second group where they kept the blood sugar at 80 to 110, right. They did this for both surgical and medical ICUs. Interestingly, what they found was in this trial, there was no difference in mortality between the two groups. However, the episodes of hypoglycemia were definitely less when the blood sugar was targeted to 140 to 180. Hence, after the NICE sugar trial across the world, the guidelines have then again changed, been changed and now currently the standard of care is that you maintain the blood sugar in an ICU patient between 140 to 180, right? That's the target. There was a follow-up study where they looked at blood sugar up to a target of 200 and again they found that the outcome was reasonably same, right? So the current guidelines now stand is that when you have a patient in ICU, your target blood sugar should be between 140 to 200. That should be the target, right? It doesn't mean that your patient is having is, is non-diabetic and patient's blood sugar is 110 or 105, you know, you give glucose to increase the glucose. No. What it means is that any patient with hyperglycemia, your target should be reasonably between 140 to 180. However, uh, this again the original study, the Leuven study actually hit back to the nice sugar trial actually criticizing their trial outcomes also but broadly speaking right we don't have a definitive answer because the patients in both the groups both the studies were different you can never have never compare two studies in that sense but having said that at as of now overall what we are looking at is a target between 140 to 200 and that's a reasonable target right so that's the group uh, again uh, here you can see this is the Leuven trial where mortality was 4.6% in the intensively treated arm where it was 8% in the control group where the patient was reasonably. So it's a clear difference, right? But the problem was that there were more episodes of hypoglycemia in the Leuven study and the problem is uh, the uh, Dutch ICUs were more militaristically managed 
uh, which is unfortunately, you know, that is one of the one of the criticisms we ultimately came out that in real life situation, uh, where you have more patients, like maybe in Indian ICU, where such intensive, uh, you know, control is probably not possible, right? Where you are more episodes of missing out and patients developing hypoglycemia than in a real world situation, right? So that that's the thing. Now, in a medically treated group, also uh, there were several studies, and Lewin study there was also uh, a medical treatment group. But even in that study, also in a medical ICU, the tight glycemic control did not have a major benefit compared to the place where it is reasonably controlled. So again, in a non-surgical ICU setting, uh, it's reasonable to say that your target should be what Nice Sugar said, that is 140 to 180. Now, there is a COIT study where they looked at, uh, you know, patients with glucocorticoids. We had discussed this when we had discussed uh, adrenal insufficiency. Uh, again, you know, uh, in those patients on glucocorticoids also, you need to keep the target same, that is 140 to 180, right? Uh, that is again a talk for a different topic altogether, right? So, overall, the point is that in surgical ICU, uh, perhaps, you know, as evidenced by Lewin trial, perhaps a slightly tighter glycemic control is better. Again, remains an area of debate, but in medical ICU, there is no benefit of a very tight glycemic control. It is always better to keep the blood sugar between 140 to 200 and that is the uh, target. You know, I am not going to the details of the, uh, you know, the other studies, right. Uh, there is a study in, again, you know, uh, residents, there is a study called CHIP study, which was done in pediatric group, okay. So, uh, in general, right, we, you know, look at a target of 140 to 180, that is a target in adult and children. And how do you do that? That is that is a part of the next topic. So this is to summarize the uh, the first aspect of our talk today. That is, uh, how do you manage? You know, what are the studies which have looked at? Again, this is important for residents, not for practical purpose. So in the surgical group, the studies which are done was Lewin study and Speck study, which was done in children, and Nice Sugar in the surgical group. Uh, the medical group, the stu studies were Lewin and Coitus study and Coit study, and the mixed group, Nice Sugar looked at both. VSEP looked at adults and CHIP study looked at children, right. Overall, the conclusion and the current guideline says that in an ICU setup, medical or surgical, keep the blood sugar between 140 to 180, right, up to 200 is reasonably acceptable. Now, let us come to the practical aspect of how do you do that, right. So, that is the uh, important aspect, what you should do and what you should not do, okay. So, there are four pillars of management, right. So, first and foremost, you know, again, uh, like I told you, we have a vicious cycle we should deal with, right. So, just managing the blood sugar is not enough, just managing the infection is not enough, you have to do both, right. Also, look at the other clinical condition as well. Remember, a patient in ICU is a complex patient, right. The patient will have some sort of an infection, patient will have some sort of inflammation, patient will have glucotoxicity, everything, right. So, managing diabetes in ICU setup is not just numbers game, you also have to look at the bigger picture, right. Is the patient on steroids, right? Yes or no? If the patient is on steroid, are we going to change the dose of steroids? Is the patient on vasopressors? Are we going to change that? Is the patient on, very importantly, uh, fluoroquinolones, often leads to dysglycemia, right? Now, you introduce a patient who is a very tightly controlled on blood sugar and suddenly you introduce a fluoroquinolone, you could have a situation where the patients develop severe hypoglycemia, right? A uh, lot of other drugs, you know, a lot of us also were not aware, right? But there are a lot of other drugs which can lead to tacrolimus, right? I have seen blood sugars of extreme glucotoxicity with just acrolimus alone, okay. Uh, so, there are many other drugs when we look at the overall picture, you need to see what drugs are contributing to the glycemic status, right. Hydro uh, you know, hydroxychloroquine, HCQS, HCQS is a powerful anti-diabetic in itself, right. Uh, you know, your perioperative, maybe, maybe your pituitary patients, you know, patients will be on glucocorticoids, patient could be on Cabergoline, which is also anti-diabetic, bromocriptine, which is also anti-diabetic in a lot of sense, right. So, uh, what you, what I am trying to tell is that when you are having a patient in the ICU, right, there will be a lot of other drugs which the patient is taking, right. One group which we had discussed earlier, alternative medications, a patient could be on, you know, some alternative therapy containing glucocorticoids for years together. And when the patient comes in the ICU, you have suddenly stopped it, right, because you, you know, are not going to give alternative medications there, right. Now, what happens, patient goes into a state of adrenal insufficiency, right. So, again, look at the bigger picture, very importantly, right. Again, glycemic control needs to be achieved as early as possible, right, with the target of 140 to 200. A lot of these cases, especially patient is critically ill, your, you know, intake, oral intake status is not secure, you are not sure, the best approach is to give IV insulin, right, uh, that is the best approach overall, right. And of course, you know, a lot of these other drugs uh, which could contribute, which are unnecessary, 
should be discontinued. Do not give sulfonylureas in your ICU patients. Never do it, right? Never do it. Uh, amongst the other drugs, right, uh, you know, citagliptin, in fact, amongst the other drugs, only gliptins are reasonably efficacious to be used in ICU or in any indoor setup. Citagliptin is, in fact, approved for use in uh, indoor patients, so you can use it. Uh, we use Ecarbos also, which is again off label. But the other drugs, metformin, uh, except in certain situations, uh, you know, SGLT2, definitely no, right? So these are all drugs which you should cons consider discontinuing. Uh, we had a separate talk on euglycemic ketoacidosis. It's a very, very important condition. We have seen a lot of patients over the years here, right? A patient on SGLT2, it is frequently used by a lot of specialties. Apart from endocrinology, they have been used by cardiologists, they have been used by uh, nephrologist and there is now clinical evidence of SGLT2 also effective in NASH and FLD patients. So they will be used by hepatologists and gastroenterologists also, right? Be aware of that, right? Uh, and now you have thousands of generic brands of depagliflozin available in our country where even we don't know what this drug is, right? So if you are in doubt, right, uh, don't assume, as you know, just check what the drug patient is taking, right? And often there will be an SGLT2. Uh, if it is there, you need to consider discontinuing. Also, look at if the patient is having acidosis, look at euglycemic ketoacidosis as an important area, right? So, these are all important uh, aspects. Uh, the cornerstone of therapy would be uh, IV insulin infusion, right? Uh, IV insulin infusion solves a lot of problems, right? Remember, an IV insulin infusion is like a basal insulin, but it is an intensive basal insulin, right? That is what you are giving. Plus, you know, it is a basal insulin which you can titrate. You can also give it to a patient who is nil by mouth. Right, you can give it to patients in in lot of situations, perioperative situation, and all and all. Right, right. So you can it's it's a broad adjustment. Right. I'll tell you uh, a few things here. Right. So when you are and you can see on the right side. Right. So IV insulin infusion. Uh, again, we typically target like I said a blood sugar of 140 to 200. That's the idea. Right. Uh, one thing which and this is where we had discussed this last time also. Uh, I have said this thousands of times in my talks and you know. Uh, across the country and across the, you know, uh, uh, our hospital also, yet it continues to be used. IV insulin infusion, use it. Your sliding scale insulin, please do not use, right? Last time also we had discussed this, right? Uh, despite that discussion, it still continues to be used. Despite that discussion, there was a patient on some 14th floor who got hypoglycemia after using sliding scale insulin. I don't, I mean, I'm actually now, you know, uh, the point is that, uh, Right, uh, sliding scale insulin actually we had discussed this last time. It actually does not benefit your patient; it harms your patient. Okay, one of the important critical things which which we have learned over a period of time. There is now a lot of studies on that also. That whether the patient is in ICU, whether the patient is in the ward, right? Whether the patient is perioperative, whether the patient is infected, whether the patient is is in whatever situation, maintaining a homeostasis, maintaining a stable blood sugar, uh, actually helps the patient, okay? Now, sliding scale insulin is a reactive form of diabetes management. There is no proactive, right? So your blood sugar goes, uh, you know, let's say blood sugar goes to 300. You give whatever, you know, some scale which is there, 16 units, 20 units, whatever. You give some units of insulin. The blood sugar suddenly comes down from 300 to 100, right? Now, you, there is no basal coverage, there is nothing. After a few hours, it goes to again 300, right? So again, you are giving insulin, bringing it out to 300 to 100. Now, Lot of studies have been done. Now this concept is well known in outpatient also that fluctuations of blood sugar actually produce more harm, right? So when you go from 100 to 300, right, there is reactive oxygen species which is developing, which is causing a damage. Now you bring from 300 to 100, you are again causing damage, right? Again, the blood sugar goes up, again you are causing damage. So this ups and downs of blood sugar actually produce more mortality and more morbidity in your patient, right? So it's a request at least in wards, you know, I have tried, unfortunately, I have not been successful, I claim that, right, right, I have tried telling people, right, I do not think people are understanding, but in ICU at least, you know, where uh, we are, you know, in a more control of the situation, do not use sliding scale insulin in this hospital, right, that is the fundamental principle, which, you know, uh, if you have not, if you, you know, probably have, do not have training in using standard of care, which is either IV insulin infusion or basal bolus, probably you should get yourself trained, right? That is, there is no third solution, right? You cannot say that mujhe nahi aata hai, so you use the wrong therapy, right? So sliding scale insulin actually produces more harm, right? IV insulin infusion, uh, 
like I said, is a more stable way of doing it, right? Uh, it is a it is a basal coverage which you are giving. Beyond that, if you are giving some basal coverage and then beyond that you are adding additional insulin which is short acting insulin, it is good, it is fine because there is some basal coverage. So what happens is when your sugar goes from like I said 300 to 100, if there is a basal coverage, the sugar will be maintained at 100. It's not going to go back to 300. So at least one aspect of the thing you are stopping, right? So that's the idea. Now whatever the situation is, remember the idea is to anticipate what is going to happen rather than to react to what is happening, right? This is the fundamental principle of diabetes management even in outpatient also, right? If you are reacting to what is happening, it is going to create more harm, right? If you are prospectively looking at what is going to happen, then it produces, it is a produce a better outcome. For example, if the patient is already diabetic, right? Patient's blood sugar is 180, 200. If you are going to introduce steroids, remember blood sugar, steroids are only going to increase the blood sugar. Right? So you have to preemptively understand what is going to happen and preemptively counter, give some countermeasures to prevent that blood sugar from going up. Right? If you give the steroids and the blood sugar goes up to 300 and then you react to it, right? that is not going to be helpful to your patient. Right? So you understand the current situation, understand what drug you are introducing and then preemptively look at what you are going to do as a solution to that. That is the broad idea of managing. That is a key practical aspect. Now amongst IV insulin infusion. We had already discussed the basal bolus, uh, bolus in the last talk, right? Perhaps you can have a separate talk again for that. But since we are discussing intensive care and we are discussing ICU, uh, the cornerstone, like I said, remem remains a, a IV insulin infusion. Now, IV insulin infusion, there are a lot of infusion uh, protocol uh, we had discussed with Sir also. You know, every institution has their own protocol. To be very honest, nobody has done any critical analysis of which protocol is better. Whatever protocol works for you, use that, right? That is the thing. And to say broadly, uh, no protocol is better than the other, right? Uh, only it, it, you know, it depends on the simplicity and complexity which you are uh, comfortable with, right? Uh, I'll discuss one which is Yale protocol which is kind of standard of care. But if you would have seen our own thing, right? We use a very simple protocol, right? Uh, which is not that complicated, right? So uh, IV insulin, whatever protocol you use, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. But I'll show you the most complex one. Right? And probably then you know tell you that things are much simpler than this. Right? So there is a protocol called Yale protocol. Now the simple idea is you take 50 units of your regular insulin, ectrapid, put it in a 50 ml of normal saline, flush it. Right? Now when I was a resident, they used to do 40 units by 40 units so that you know uh, there is some element of you know instead of filling it, filling your uh, you know infusion, uh, just 50 cc syringe completely, you put 40 units of 40 ml but it does not really make too much of a difference. So you take 50 units of ectrapid or regular insulin in 50 ml of normal saline, flush the entire system once with normal saline so that there is no insulin uh, tagging around. Your initial dose should be whatever value your current blood sugar is divided by 100 rounded to the nearest 0.5, right? So let us say your blood sugar was 300, divide by 100, start at 3 ml per hour, right? That is the starting point, right? Or let us say it was 320, round it to the nearest 0 0.5, again it will be 3 ml per hour, right? So that is that is the idea you should do. and then. What you do next, the adjustment is, like I said, a little bit complicated. If the blood sugar is low, right, let us say the blood sugar starts dropping, if it is less than 50, you discontinue the infusion. If it is between 50 to 69, again you discontinue the infusion. If it is 70 to 90, right, you discontinue for a few minutes, 30 minutes and reassess, right. In lot of these cases, if the patient is having severe hypoglycemia, you need to give 25 percent or 50 percent dextrose, right, uh, as you can see less than 50, 50 to 69. But when it is 70 to 99, Again, I have seen this so many times and this we had discussed last time also. I think uh, there is something called anchoring effect, okay? Uh, if, if you have, you know, a uh, lot of money in your bank account, right? Let us say you have one CR in your bank account. Somebody gives you 10,000 rupees, it is a drop in the ocean, right? right? But if you have only 10,000 in your bank account, it is literally double your income, right? That is the thing with lot of times I have noticed in hospitals, right? That we are so used to seeing 200 blood sugars and 300 blood sugars that 80 blood sugar looks low. Why 80 blood sugar is normal, okay? All of us right now, unless if you are having diabetes or unless you are hypoglycemic, your blood sugar is probably 80, okay? Now, if my blood sugar is 80 and I start giving dextrose to everybody on 80, probably you will be getting a dextrose pint chauvis kalak in a hospital, which is right. So, please remember uh, in a physiological state, right? these blood sugar levels are normal, but I understand if your patient is on a ventilator and patient is critically ill, maybe you are scared, 
that uh, AT blood sugar may be. But the point being that be prudent, right? Don't be again reactive. Uh, recheck after a few minutes, right? If you want, but don't need to give dextrose when your blood sugar is 70 to 99. Just observe, okay? Of course, don't need to give insulin also. So just monitor, okay? Now, let's take the other situation, right? So your patient comes with blood sugar of 320. Uh, or let's say 300, you start at 3 ml per hour, right, infusion. Now, Yale protocol, what you have to do is, you have to see two things. You have to see the current glucose value and you have to see the change in the glucose value, right? Like I'm saying, it's complicated. Uh, there was an app which uh, somebody had made. Unfortunately, the app got discontinued, right? Uh, we are now planning to reintroduce, make it ourselves and reintroduce this. It's a very elegant system, right? Uh, it's a very elegant system to make it into a computerized format, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's basically, you know, an app waiting to be made, right? Uh, when you think, in a practical terms, it's very complicated, but you use it like an app, it's not that difficult, right? There was an IP, IV, uh, IP insulin uh, app. That app is currently discontinued, right? So, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so, what you have to do is, you have to see two things. You have to see the change in the glucose, and you have to see the current glucose, right? So, now, let's say the patient's blood sugar was 300, right? Now, the current bl blood glucose is, let's say, 250, right? So, if the blood sugar is more than 250, right? Now, the blood sugar has come down, right, from 300 to 250, right? So, what you have to see is you have to see the column where what was the change, right? So, the change is more than in one hour, the blood sugar has come down from, so it's almost 50 milligram per deciliter. So, what you have to see is blood sugar right now is 250, right? It has come down by this level. So, what you do at this point, it's a rapid fall. So, hold the drip for 30 minutes and then recheck, right? Let's say the blood sugar was 300. Right, and it has come down to uh, 320, it has come down to 300. Now, it's only fallen by 20 milligram per deciliter. So, two things, current blood sugar is 300, which is more than 250, right? What happened to the blood sugar? It came down. How, what rate did it come down? It came down by, let's say, 1 to 20. So, in this case, you need to reduce the drip by delta. What is delta? I'll come to that, right? So, I'm saying it's complicated, right? The point is, you have to look at the current blood glucose, also you have to look at the change in blood glucose, right? Now, let's say the blood glucose was 320 right and it went up to 380 after one hour then you take that column right so blood glucose is more than 300 more than 250 but blood glucose has gone up then you need to double the rate of your infusion right rate of delta so this is what you need to understand by yale protocol right like i said uh, soon maybe make it into this into an app which will become very easy right so this is the delta okay so delta is what was the current rate so the current rate of infusion, let's say our patient, right, patient's blood sugar was 320, uh, it went up to 380, you need to double the delta, the rate of infusion was 3 uh, ml per hour, right. So take the second column, the delta is 1, right, so you need to increase by 2 delta, that is you need to increase by 3x, uh, by, by 3, right. So your infusion rate was 3, make it 6, that is what it is saying, right. So this is how you basically follow, complicated, right, what we do, very simple. Right? You would have seen our protocol, very simple. So, divide by 100, our rate of infusion is also the same. Right? So, if it is 250 to 300, 2.5 ml per hour, right? in scales of 50, right? we, do, we don't look at the change. Right? That is the thing. Uh, unless, of course, there are patients with severe insulin resistance, uh, in which case you have to look at the change. Now, the reason why, the reason why uh, we don't uh, do this is because there is a fundamental difference and you would have noticed in our practice what we do which is fundamental different from that. We also give a simultaneous subcutaneous insulin, right, which is our protocol which is like, which is different from what a uh, lot of these ICU guidelines say, right. A uh, lot of these ICU guidelines basically do not allow or do not, you know, encourage use of subcutaneous insulin because there is a thinking that the subcutaneous insulin is not going to be absorbed because of the patient having, you know, hypotension and other things. Uh, having said that, uh, most of our patients are not that severely hypotensive that the subcutaneous insulin does not get absorbed. It does get absorbed, right? The additional advantage you get by covering some amount of subcutaneous insulin is that those fluctuations which are there will definitely be reduced. And a lot of the times, you are then able to discontinue the IV because you are already given some amount of basal insulin. You would have seen in our protocol also, less than 200, we generally discontinue the infusion, right? which puts a less burden on the hospital system also because the nursing staff also doesn't have to keep checking the, uh, you know, the, uh, the infusion rate. Also, what it does is that, that fear, remember these are IV insulin which rapidly reduces the blood sugar, that fear of sudden drop of blood sugar also reduces, right? Because now you are giving sub subcutaneous coverage so that sudden high will also not happen, but the sudden low will also be prevented, right? That is where I think, uh, you know, 
that approach is something which is different from what is there from the ICUs. But uh, these, remember, these guidelines are on system where the patient is only on IV insulin. And IV insulin is continuous, blood sugar will suddenly go up, right? Because there is no other basal coverage. There's nothing else to give, right? Especially a patient who is having ketosis or other situation, right? So this is how you do it. Yale protocol suggests that initially you need to check one hourly till there are three consecutive readings which are stable. Then you reduce the frequency of checking two hourly, four hourly, six hourly and so on, right? In our practice, you would have seen, like I said, you know, because we're using a subcutaneous coverage, we always generally check too early, right? Again, understanding the uh, burden which the nursing staff has, burden of a hospital, we are still, you know, of course, we have better resources, you know, compared to government hospitals where it's even worse, right? It's very difficult to ask the nursing staff to keep checking one hourly and keep checking because there are other things also with the nursing staff has to do. So, doing that into context, we have a reasonable approach where we check too early, right? But the, you know, the guideline clearly says that the initial protocol is one hourly, right? And then comes the situation of how do you completely switch from the IV insulin to subcutaneous insulin. So your patient is then to be shifted from the ward, from the ICU to the ward, what do you do? Now this is where uh, the, you know, uh, again a little bit of understanding and this is, this is to be understood and this is to be done, practiced, uh, you know, a lot of times. Uh, having said that, we ourselves don't do this as strictly as we often talk about it, the reason is we are already giving some subcutaneous insulin, right? Already on board, right? But let's say your patient is completely on IV insulin. You have to look at the last period of time, generally four to six hours when the blood glucose level was reasonably stable, right? So the rate of infusion was stable. So let's say in the last six hours, the patient is receiving two ml per hour of infusion. So take the amount of insulin given in the last six hours, extrapolate to 24, 24 hours, right? So six hours, the patient is receiving, let's say six unit, over 24 hours, the patient will receive 24 units of insulin. That's the total dose of insulin, right? The total dose of insulin, 50% of the insulin will be basal, 50% of the insulin will be bolus, right? So let's say 24 units of total insulin, 12 units will be basal, let's say lantus, 12 units will be the total dose of bolus, that is, let's say epidra. That total dose you divide into three groups, right? So before breakfast, before lunch, and before dinner. So four, four, four units. So let's say your patient is using two ml per hour infusion in the last six hours, right? your patient's treatment regime when it is shifted to the ward will be 12 units of lantus and 4 units of epidra before breakfast, 4 units before lunch, 4 units before dinner, right? Simple mathematics. And then beyond that, you keep adjusting depending on the blood sugar level. So that's that's the gross protocol which you have to follow. Uh, also remember that there is some amount of overlap which you'll have to do, especially if your patient is having ketosis or patient is having no insulin on board. General routine patients may zyada fark nahi hai. If you have worked in a pediatric ICU, you know immediately if you do not overlap, the patient goes into ketosis, back, into ketosis, right? Especially pediatric newly diagnosed type 1 diabetics, right? Uh, we have burned our fingers so many times, you know, patient had to be shifted from ward to ICU again, ICU to ward again. You want to prevent that from happening? Overlap, right? Now, when you overlap, what we generally do is, if you are going to give a basal coverage overlap, have a period of 2 hours. So, if I am going to give Lantus, what I do is, I give Lantus and after 2 hours, I discontinue the infusion, right? If I'm giving a short-acting insulin, right, so often we, what we generally recommend is that you do that overlap over lunch period, right? So over the period of lunch, we give a short-acting insulin and after one hour, I discontinue the infusion, right? And then monitor the sugar, right? It's always a good idea to do it in the morning time, afternoon time, after your round is over, so that you are also in track of the blood sugars, right? So that you don't unnecessarily produce. If you do that at night time, it's like, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, extubating patients at night, right, which I generally, it's a not a, it's not a good idea because the problem is, right, uh, you are unnecessarily at night creating an emergency which probably could have been avoided, right. So, morning is fine, right. So, uh, you know, so, so the idea is that if you want to do that switch, it's always better to do it when. Basal co uh, department. No, no. Uh, role of that. I'll, we'll discuss that, right? So that's the broad idea, right? I'll not go into the case. Uh, last part, I'll just, uh, we had discussed this last time. Let me just uh, reiterate this for the ICU uh, uh, team as well. Uh, hypoglycemia, right? That is something we need to understand. First, understand the definition, right? Remember, blood sugar less than 70 is hypoglycemia, <laughs> not less than 100, right? Please understand. Uh, that's level 1 hypoglycemia, right? Uh, level 2, uh, they have misprinted. Level 2 is less than 54. Level 3 is any situation where the patient has altered mental status, right? So, if you have hypoglycemia, secondary to altered mental status. Uh, so, level 2 and level 3, you require IV glucose. Level 1, if the patient is taking orally, you can give oral dextrose, right? Uh, 
Now, the protocol is like this. Let us say the patient has blood sugar of 69, right. Often times I get call in the morning, I get woken up from a morning, patient had blood sugar of 68, we have sugar pouch. De diya. First of all, uh, two things. A, it is not going to work in my patients because my patients will be on ekarbos, right. Sugar pouch ko kasu thawan na thi, right. It is not, it is in fact that drug itself is known to not produce sugar pouch into glucose, right. So, it is not going to correct hypoglycemia. The second problem is after a few hours, it will then disintegrate into glucose where the sugar will go up and then I will be forced to give more insulin, right. Standard treatment is not sugar pouch, not mithu, not, uh, no, not sweets, not chocolates, not fruit juices, glucose, right. You need to give glucose, okay. So, the protocol is give glucose, right. After 15 minutes, give 15 grams of glucose. After 15 minutes, recheck the sugar. If the sugar is still low, repeat the process till the sugar comes to more than 70. That is the protocol, right. And then you call and tell me how much insulin or whether it is required or not or whether what should be given or not, right. If it is a type 1 diabetes, even if the blood sugar is 70, even if the blood sugar is 69, you have to give insulin because there is no insulin on board, right. Otherwise, the next sugar will be 340, right or patient goes into ketosis again, especially children, okay. So, these are things you need to understand. If the patient is altered sensorium, patient is not able to eat, give IV insulin. Do not be afraid of it, give it, right. Another thing which is not there and which, which we were always taught and which is, which is thankfully not a problem too much of here. Remember uh, Wernicke syndrome, right? A lot of these patients, alcoholic patients, poor nutritionally on ICU for long time, has been admitted for ICU last 15, 20 days, right? Remember to also give thiamine, right, with the dextrose, right? That principle, right? Uh, Korsakoff syndrome is, uh, Wernicke is, is not that common, but when it happens, nobody recognizes it, right? And that is the problem, right? Uh, so, uh, alcoholic patients, malnourished patients, uh, patients on in ICU for a long time, hospitalized for a long time, uh, also always give, right. Patients especially coming to the emergency, always give, consider giving thiamine or neurobion or whatever you want to give along with that, right. So, that is the strat, uh, strategy for hypoglycemia. Persistent hypoglycemia, again common mistake, right. I often get, uh, you know, I, it's stopped now, but I used to get often calls at middle of the night saying that, Sir, where can we get glucagon? I said, why do you need glucagon? I said, glucagon, patient is in hypoglycemia, doesn't come out of it. Hi glucagon is not the solution, okay. Glucagon only works instantly, right. The glucagon is actually a substitute of, instead of giving dextrose, you can give glucagon. It's not a substitute for persistent hypoglycemia, okay. For persistent hypoglycemia, you need to recognize what is the reason for it. Is it insulin dependent? Is it insulin independent? Is it because of adrenal insufficiency, which is often a cause? Or is it because of some sulfonylurea which was given, right? Or is it because of dysglycemia caused by uh, fluoroquinolones, right? So many times we have seen patients with very tight glycemic control on sulfonylurea, develops diarrhea, goes to local pharmacy, somebody gives Oflox, right, with very common, okay. This is Ofloxacin, right, comes in the emergency with hypoglycemia, persists for days, right. So, SUs are very notorious, right. Uh, so, if you have a persistent hypoglycemia, two things, right, of course you treat it. I am not saying you do not treat it. The point is give a infusion of dextrose. Secondly, try to recognize the cause, right, because that is more important, right. So, with this we end, right. I will not go into ketosis and other special situations. Uh, we will use that time to discuss some questions.